Today, we remember Jesus and the story of his birth. Jesus is our King. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Jesus is the way. With Jesus, even dark places are light. Jesus is the truth. In Jesus, we shall live forever. Jesus is our life. And a warm welcome and happy Christmas. My name is Steve. I'm rector here in Streatham Parish. And I'm Chris, Associate Minister, and happy Christmas from me too. So welcome to our online service today. And it's wonderful to be able to light our final candle on the Christmas, on the Advent wreath even. So let's light them all. So that's the four red ones, and as it's Christmas Day today, the white one. So let's pray. God, our Father, today the Saviour is born, and those who live in darkness are seeing a great light. Help us who greet the birth of Christ with joy, to live in the light of your Son, and to share the good news of your love. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the light who has come into the world. Amen. Amen. The Son of Righteousness has dawned with healing in his wings. Let us come to the light of Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord of grace and truth, we confess our unworthiness to stand in your presence as your children. We have sinned. Forgive us and heal us. The Virgin Mary accepted your call to be the mother of Jesus. Forgive our disobedience to your will. We have sinned. Forgive us and heal us. Your son, our saviour, was born in poverty in a manger. Forgive our greed and rejection of your ways. We have sinned. Forgive us and heal us. The shepherds left their flocks to go to Bethlehem. Forgive our self-interest and lack of vision. We have sinned. Forgive us and heal us. The wise men followed the star to find Jesus the King. Forgive our reluctance to seek you. We have sinned. Forgive us and heal us. The God who loved the world so much that he sent his son to be our saviour. Forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in this world through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And our reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter two, beginning at the first verse. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Chris, you're going to pop up in a minute to bring us our talk this morning, after which we'll hear or respond through a carol. Luke starts what is to be one of the world's most famous narratives on the world stage, as it is traditionally recounted. He starts with emperors and governors, who are, after all, the people who make history, aren't they? These gigantic figures decree and the little ant-like ordinary folk rush around madly in response to their orders. Augustus lifts a finger and the whole of the region is on the move. The roads are choked with slow-moving donkeys, impatient horses and carriages, trudging figures with bundles and wailing children, all off to be counted because the emperor and governor say so. That's power for you. Luke then switches his focus to a different but equally vast stage. Now his scene is the sweep of Israel's history. Joseph goes admittedly at the bidding of the rulers, but he goes as one who knows that he too represents history makers because he is a descendant of David. In the history of God's relationships with his people, David is pivotal, at least as important as any Roman emperor or governor. So civil history and religious history are coming together to provide the gigantic backdrop. And we know that we're to witness something enormous. But then, hang on, whatever is going on, onto this massive stage comes a baby. The sense of anticlimax is huge. Everything is done to diminish this strange entrance of the principal character. His birth happens off stage and he's shoved into a corner because the stage is already full of other more important looking people and events. We begin to get bewildered. History is being turned on its head. Well, exactly. History is being turned on its head. The powerfully significant scenery of religious and political stature is quite proper. History is being changed here. But part of the change is in our understanding of how momentous events are to be judged. From the moment this baby is born and wrapped in bands of cloth and putting it in a corner somewhere, corners and dark, insignificant places take on a whole new meaning. Rulers and governors can shout away centre stage all they like, but we begin to see that they may not be taking part in anything at all important. Whatever they may think, their reigns are short-lived. They're no longer the ones who are shaping the world. This is what the angels tell the astonished shepherds, which is, in itself, part of this strange shift in history. Why send your heavenly host to a group of shepherds? If they were to go to an emperor or governor, they might even be able to get the baby a proper start in life or at least a decent room and cradle. But no, the angels are sent to the shepherds. So the shepherds are the first to learn that the world has changed forever. And don't go mistaking the sign the angels warn the stunned shepherds. We're not the sign for all our winged brightness. The baby is the sign. He's the symbol of salvation. And as Titus says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. I wonder what that means for us today, both locally and as a world. Grace is one of those very hard to explain words. Some people say grace before meals, thanking God for the gift of food. We're grateful for someone's kindness gratified by good news, congratulated when successful. Grace is something to do with thankfulness, generosity and giving freely. In Britain, we address some royalty as your grace or maybe a bishop, though maybe not so much nowadays. Students may get a day's grace to finish an essay or parliament declares an act of grace to pardon a criminal. We speak too of falling from grace. But even the most hardened of criminals can have their lives turned around by grace. When Jesus was born on earth, the grace of God appeared. 
Only grace would first reveal the Son of God to society's outcasts, the grubby, despised shepherds. Only grace would locate the greatest birth in history in a dark, smelly corner. Nothing could be clearer than this set of contrasts that Luke sees attending the birth of the one who is the saviour. The huge machinery put into operation to get into the right place at the right time of the right ancestors. And then when he arrives, he's born into obscurity. The mass choir of angels is sent to announce the news, but to shepherds who will have no power to broadcast what they've been told. It's as though God is saying, things can only be changed this way. Power and might, grandeur and status only perpetuate themselves and draw people further and further into the world they have made themselves, a world that clearly does not work. Only this can draw them out of themselves and make them look at the world I created, the real world. God's way to draw us back to the real aim of our existence is a strange way. He comes to live with us as one of us in utter humility. He's born in fragility and danger as a human baby with no wealth or power of privilege to protect him. All the trappings of earth and heaven are held at arm's length so that Jesus can be just what we are, but so often refuse to be, fully human, dependent only upon God the Father. And so God continues to offer us grace today. If we open our eyes, we might see God producing acts of grace everywhere, small acts of kindness, someone asking after you if you're unwell, an unexpected gift or call. So now that God's grace has come to us, we can now live new lives, graceful lives. In Titus's words, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing for the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. This humility is to be the source of our new life. If we are humble enough to accept it, our nourishment lies in the animal trough. This is the bread of life. Are we too grand to feed with the animals? Or can we join the shepherds in rejoicing and praising God for all we have seen and heard? May we experience God's grace afresh upon us this Christmas tide and always. Amen.
And so we turn to our prayers. Holy and lowly one, Jesus, friend, brother, we rejoice in your coming among us. You come down to lift us up. You come as the light to our darkness. And we welcome and adore you. We pray for your church throughout the world. May we reveal your saving power and abide in your love. We pray for the work of the church among the poor and the outcasts of our world. We pray too for the peace of Jerusalem, for peace in the Holy Land where your birth was set. We pray for peace among nations and goodwill throughout the world. We pray for the communities to which we belong and the places where we work, that they may know your presence and your peace. Lord, born at Bethlehem, we pray for our families and friends, for all with whom we will share this Christmas time. We rejoice in the love we have for each other and your love for us all. We remember absent friends and loved ones, all and all who will be alone at this Christmas time. Particularly remember those who are being forced into this situation through the difficulties we share. At this time of joy and rejoicing, we remember all who are sad, all whose lives are full of sorrow, fear or darkness. We pray for all who are in care, in prison, in hospital or in a hospice. We remember those who have no home and will sleep rough this night. We pray too. For those who are ill, those known to us and those known only unto you. And at this time, we pray for those who grieve. Lord, may there may be a moment of remembering Christmas time with loved ones as a happy time. Be a comfort that only you might give. And in all our festivities, Lord, may we remember you. May we celebrate your birthday. And may Christ always be at the centre of our festivities. And so we gather those prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. So, Chris, what does Christmas look like in your house? Well, I'm just going to cough just for a second. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Um, very quiet. We always generally have a quiet Christmas. We're having a, a neighbour in who um, has been coming to us ever since we moved here eight years ago. Uh, he, he used to live with his cousin, but his cousin sadly died. And they both came the first Christmas we were here. And that's a tradition now for us. So it'd be good to be with him. Great. We don't have a quiet one in this house. <laughs> Three girls <laughs> make sure it's very noisy. And then, of course, we're going to be Zooming family and friends as the day goes on. OK, well, while Chris has a coughing fit again, <laughs> I will just let you know that there will be no online service tomorrow, Boxing Day, 
but there will be one service in the whole parish um, at St. Lawrence Church at 10.30. The online service will be back uh, next Sunday, the 2nd of January. So um, we pray that over the next few days, you'll have a really good time as we celebrate the birth of the Saviour amongst us and you enjoy time, whatever it looks like at this time crazy time of limboness. So as we finish our final prayer of blessing, may the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Mary and Joseph and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. So we go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. So we're going to finish with a carol. Happy Christmas, everyone. Take care. Happy Christmas. Bye bye.